Okay, so I've already started mapping the argument from Singer's Famine, Affluence, and Morality. In these first three boxes, I just copied and pasted the things that I thought were the main claim and first two premises from the actual paper. And now I've started mapping the argument. And one reason to just do this separately is so that way, if you decide to paraphrase or make changes, you can look at the originals. One thing you might want to do is make it clear that what you've included here is a direct quote and provide the citation for where you got it from. I'm using the page numbers from the physical copy that I gave you in class. And this is something you might do just to make citing your sources easy on yourself. If you've ever had the experience of finishing your paper and then you have this huge task of going to hunt down all the page numbers, that sucks. Well, the solution to that is keep track of page numbers and where you're looking at sources as you go. It's a game changer. Do it. So easy. Okay. So here is, I just picked the first part of the main claim. I'm not sure if the whole thing will be a main claim or not, but I picked the first part just because it's short and snappy. And I picked the qualified version of the premise because it's the one that would be easiest to argue for. Although, and I'm using the principle of charity here, I think that's the one you can definitely make the strongest argument for. But Singer actually, towards the end of the paper, if you recall, because you've read it, focuses on this one and thinks this, it, there is no reason to qualify it other than this one is just easier to argue for. But, so you could choose, either, I'm just gonna choose this one. So I've got the way people in relatively affluent countries react to a situation like that in Bengal cannot be justified. Why not? Well, for one thing, suffering and death from lack of food, shelter, and medical care are bad. Two, principle. If it's in our power to prevent something very bad from happening without sacrificing anything morally significant, we ought to do it. So how we're acting about what's going on in Bengal cannot be justified. One thing I'm noticing is that the language is a bit different between these two. So I'm thinking, can I rephrase this in a way that more clearly connects it to these premises? And I think the answer is yes. And so I've hidden some boxes up here. Here is some language that will more clearly connect to, so I'm gonna, move this whole thing to this claim and look at how much better it fits. Suffering and death from lack of food, shelter, and medical care are bad. If it's in our power to prevent something bad from happening, we ought to do it. Therefore, we ought to prevent suffering and death from lack of food, shelter, and medical care. So my next, this is, if I, if I just wasn't even looking at this, if I just had the premises, this is what I would fill in as following from the premises I'm given. So the next thing I'm gonna ask is, do these things essentially state the same thing? What is the difference, if anything? Because I wanna capture what Singer has actually argued, but I wanna do it as clearly as possible. So I wanna be faithful to what he's actually arguing and make it as clear as I can. So is this the same as this? And I think that it is, and here's why. Here's a, a way that I could phrase it that is sort of in between these two things. So to say, I'm looking over here again, we ought to prevent these things, is to say it would be wrong not to prevent these things. That failing to prevent suffering from lack of food, shelter, and medical care is wrong slash cannot be justified. Now, it might not be immediately obvious to you that these two ways of putting it are the same, but that has to do with how the word ought is being used here. So if you morally ought to do something, that's a pretty strong claim. If you morally ought to do this, then you're morally required to do it. Then it would be wrong for you to not do it. So treating those as, treating this as very strong means that this would be synonymous with this. Failing to prevent these things can't be justified. Now, the way people in relatively affluent countries react to a situation like that in Bengal, not necessarily Bengal, but 
situations like that cannot be justified. So now the language is pretty similar. And what, how are people reacting to this particular situation in the 70s or situations like that? Well, people are failing to prevent suffering from lack of food, shelter, and medical care. And that can't be justified. That is wrong. You ought to do that. So there is a pretty close connection between these claims. I'm going to choose the most general one here because as we talked about in class and in a previous video, this argument is supposed to be general. It's not specifically about Bengal or present day Bangladesh. It is not about a particular famine. It is about the fact that bad things are going on, that people are dying and suffering from lack of food, shelter, and medical care. And there are other people who could do something about it, but don't. So long as that situation is present, this argument applies. And so we should formulate it as generally as possible. So question, why did Singer formulate it more specifically in terms of Bengal? Well, he chose to introduce the paper, and again, looking at this, the introduction to the paper, these four, first four paragraphs, he chose to introduce it by providing an example, by framing it in terms of a specific example. Even though the ultimate argument is not about this specific example, it just applies to it and helps us to think about a concrete case. And the main claim comes after he set up this particular example. So there are reasons why it was framed this way for rhetorical writerly reasons, but insofar as we're capturing the underlying argument, let's use the more general claim. Now, we have already set aside, we've already included references to the actual text here in this way. But another thing we could do is use notes. So let's say I'm making this argument. One thing I could do, I'm hovering over the box and whenever the little hand pointer is in place, if I right click, I can add notes. So one thing that I might add as notes is the actual language he uses in case I'm citing this later or something like that. So I'm gonna edit notes and I'm going to add, where am I getting this from? What does he actually say? And I might also add this other way of stating it just in case I wanna remind myself or maybe I even wanna, depending on how I write about it, maybe I wanna use this language instead. So, this is an IE in other words kind of claim. I can close up the sidebar over here. And now there's a little note thing to tell me that I had a note here. And now I can get rid of these. I'm just hitting the delete key. Okay, so here's a pretty clear argument so far. Now I wanna check for any implicit premises. We talked about this in class. What are the implicit premises here? Well, let's look at the language of the principle. If it is in our power to prevent something bad from happening without sacrificing anything morally significant, we ought to do it. And the main claim says we ought to do something. So we've got some connection here. What is it we ought to do? Prevent suffering death. Okay. Um, if it is in our power to prevent something very bad from happening. Well, what is very bad? Suffering and death. That's something that's very bad. What are some other words in the principle that are important? Well, it has to be within our power to do it. And we have to be able to do it without sacrificing anything morally significant. So that's going to be the hint at what our co-premises are. So to add the co-premise, I'm going to hit add sibling claim up here. Implicit premise, it is in our power to prevent suffering and death from lack of food, shelter, and medical care. And notice though that he does emphasize this in the introduction here. He says suffering and death are not inevitable in the first line here. and. He says, 
the decisions and actions of human beings can prevent this kind of suffering. So he has explicitly stated this earlier in the paper. So maybe it is implicit, maybe it's not. Um, we can treat it either way. But if you want to mark it implicit, there's a little toggle implicit claim. And then once you do, it's in little dotted lines here. Or if you think that it's not implicit, you can just say, you know, paragraph one. And since the paper that we looked at, the physical copy has single spaced, like there's a lot of content on each page, it might help to use paragraph instead of page numbers to figure out where we're pulling stuff from. So let's do that for it. One, two, three, four, five is where we get the first premise and six, the second one. Okay, so I've added which paragraphs I got these claims from and quote marks to make it clear that I quoted these. And just like I did before, I'm gonna copy and paste this and put the actual words that Singer used as a note. Close that up. Okay. And we're still missing one more premise, which is that we can do it without thereby sacrificing anything morally significant. Question, is this an implicit premise or not? Well, just like this one, I sort of figured out that it should be added here by looking at the two obviously explicit premises and figuring out that these would be required in order for this kind of conclusion to follow. So we could toggle this as an implicit premise. The other test is, does he actually say this, come out and explicitly say it in words in the paper? And kind of. So one thing that he does up front is note that even the countries who are giving some amount of money for comparative purposes, he's talking about, you know, a, transportation project and how much more that that costs. And he says the implication is that the British government value, values a supersonic transport port more than 30 times as highly as it values the lives of 9 million refugees. And likewise, Australia and the amount spent on their opera house is way more than they spend on these particular refugees. For a contemporary example, maybe you saw articles like this commenting on the amount of money spent rebuilding the Notre Dame Cathedral when that money could have gone to other things. So he does seem to be commenting on how we, or as collectives or as governments, spend money in ways that show we're spending it on things that are not as morally significant as the lives of 9 million refugees or something like that. So it's kind of in there. We could put paragraph one, or we could just treat both of these as implicit premises, which I'm inclined to do just because I had to figure out that they go with these two, but really it could go either way in this case. So I'll make a note to myself, the fact that this still would need to be spelled out and this presumably could be, or at least could be argued, is less important or morally significant than the lives of refugees suggests, well, so that's why I'm kind of inclined to treat these as implicit premises, just because you kind of have to go back and figure them out, but really this distinction doesn't matter for now. So let's take a look at our map so far.